Hello class, this is Demetrius Wilson. This is Management 2. We are now on Chapter 9, Basic Elements of Individual Behavior and Organizations. Uh, our learning objectives for the chapter are explain the nature of individual organization relationship, define personality and describe personality attributes that affect behavior in organizations, discuss the individual attitudes in organizations and how they affect behavior, describe the basic perpetual or perceptual processes uh, and the role of attributions in organizations, discuss the causes and consequences of stress and describe how it can be managed, and describe creativity and its role in organizations, and explain how workplace behaviors can directly or indirectly influence organizational effectiveness. All very, very important. I want you guys to read uh, the quote, right? They told me I was a manager, but I spent a lot of time sweeping and emptying the trash, right? Uh, so uh, that's from a, a former Radio Shack manager. Be sure to uh, uh, to read uh, the story, the initial story at the beginning about Radio Shack. Uh, you know, obviously Radio Shack is on the decline. You look at companies like uh, Circus City that there were management books written about that are no longer in existence. You look at companies like Good Guys, like where are they now? Uh, so you have to understand that companies need to remain cutting edge and uh, their people need to remain cutting edge if they want to be successful and continue to be successful in today's ever-evolving business environment. Uh, we'll start off with a psychological contract. So it's not a written, written contract. It's just an agreement that... I know that I'm going to do certain things, and the person who hires me believes that I'm going to do those things, right? Uh, so psychological contract is an overall set of expectations held by an individual with respect to what he or she will contribute to the organization and what the organization will provide in return. He expects that I'm going to uh, increase sales by 20%, and I expect that they're going to give me a certain salary and increase my salary by 5% the next year. So contributions, that's what the individual provides to the organization, and inducements, that's what the organization provides to the individual, right? So it's always a give and take relationship, but you must know those two terms for the quiz, for the test. These are contributions from the individual, which need lead to the inducements from the organization. So you have effort, ability, loyalty, skills, time, and competencies is what comes from the individual that works there. And inducements from the organization is pay, job security, benefits, career opportunities, status, and promotion opportunities, all all great things. Uh, so let's read a little bit more about the psychological contract. Uh, they are the basic assumptions that individuals have about their relationships with their organization. I assume that I should be there on time every day, and I'm sure the organization does as well. Such contracts are defined in terms of contributions by the individual relative to the inducements from the organization. So like I said, it's a give and take relationship. I give what uh, you know the performance, and they give the inducements, which uh, allows me or um, motivates me to stay around at the company. Uh, person job fit. If you don't have the right person, you're going to have some problems. Uh, so the person job fit is the extent to which uh, contributions made by the individual match the inducements offered by the organization. So if I'm looking for high pay and your company's not paying very high, then it's not a good fit. If I'm looking for something that warms my heart as far as the job, uh, then uh, me just doing sales is not going to be it. But me doing something uh, that uh, helps the homeless or something like that, then that's a uh, that's a, actually a good fit. Uh, in terms of what I want to do. So you have to have the right people for the right positions. Now, everybody's not right for every single position. That's why, you know, the recruitment, selection, and all that stuff, uh, you need a skilled individual to do so. Uh, so nature of individual di differences. So individual differences are personal attributes that vary from one person to another, right? We're all different, like snowflakes. Uh, we're all uh, different individuals. Uh, some of you guys out there are twins or triplets, uh, but but we're all different individuals, and and that makes us different. So as a manager, you need to be manage these individuals differently, and not to say you manage them so so differently, but everybody's a little bit unique. So for instance, there's no nobody who I've ever worked with who's ever reported to me that I couldn't find something in common with them. Uh, you know, it's just really easy uh, to find something in common with individuals. Um, individual differences, personal attributes that vary from one person to another, uh, then they vary because you have different personalities. So personality is a relatively stable set of psychological uh, and behavioral attributes that distinguish one person from another. My personality is uh, 
let's just for example let's just say someone is you know is a hyper they're excited they smile all the time versus somebody else who doesn't smile a lot they're very shy very mundane but you know nothing's wrong with either one it's just that's what that individual uh, person's uh, personality is uh, so everybody like different strokes for different folks uh, everybody's their own individual and you don't have to corral them to just be the same type of individual uh, so if you look at this uh, these are talking about the five uh, big traits. Uh, so it didn't, uh, let me go back to the other page. I don't know, if maybe it said it at the bottom, but I know what they are. Oh, so the big five personality traits, uh, if you flip over to the next page, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, which you want to avoid this one, extroversion, and openness, right? So uh, extroverts, a lot of people say, oh, everybody needs to be, well, everybody doesn't need to be an extrovert, but certain positions are better if you are extrovert, such as a sales uh, manager or sales rep. Uh, openness, uh, conscientiousness, agreeableness. So we'll talk about all of those. Uh, but one you kind of want to stay away from is the neuroticism. Uh, so Big Five model of personality uh, represents an increasingly accepted framework for understanding personality traits in organizational settings. In general, experts tend to agree that personality traits toward the left of each dimension, as illustrated in the figure, are more positive in organizational settings, whereas traits closer to the right are less positive. Meaning... If you're on this side down here, if you're, your agreeableness, your conscientiousness, your intro, extroversion, uh, uh, meaning you're more in, uh, introverted and your openness is less, if you're on the right side there and you're more neurotic, that's not a good thing. See, as you see, this is the only one. You want to be less neurotic. So you want to be on this side, right? So you see those big five personality traits. You want to have a lot of those. Now, I know if you're an introvert, you're just going to be an introvert, and we can't get you all the way over here. I mean, sorry, all the way over here to more extroversion. But, you know, at least we get you somewhere in the, in the middle, uh, make new friends, meet new people, give high fives. Um, agreeableness, so let's go through the big five uh, one by one. A person needs ability to get along with others, right? So are you agreeable? Can you get along with people or do you just hate everybody? You should be agreeable and you should be able to uh, get along with others, especially in a workplace. Conscientiousness, a person's ability to manage multiple tasks and consistently meet deadlines, right? So if you wear a lot of different hats, I can meet this deadline. Got a lot of different things coming through my head, but I remember them all and I get you know most of the stuff right. Uh, neuroticism, extent to which a person experiences anxiety or is poised, uh, calm, resilient, and secure. Uh, right, so the the anxiety part, somebody's you know super neurotic. Uh, those people are less uh, neurotic. Will be uh, relatively poised, calm, and resilient. Right, so uh, if you're neurotic, they're kind of you know spazzing out is, is a term you would use. But if you're not as neurotic, you're going to be calm. You're going to be resilient. Uh, you're going to think up a game plan. Extroversion is a person's comfort level with relationships, right? If you're very uncomfortable with relationships, then you're going to be an introvert. But also, you know, you, 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 and as one of the videos that you'll see in the uh, mo chapter nine module, you'll see that if some people are introverted, just they just don't like certain things. They don't like going out to the big party. Maybe they want to go home and crack open a nice book. It's just what different people like, and I'm okay with that. I know people who are introverts, and I'm I'm cool with with that, and I give them their space. I know people who are extroverts, and we can go hang out and have a good time. Uh, openness is a person's uh, rigidity of uh, beliefs and uh, range of interest, right? Are you open to new things? Are you, uh, you know, are you open minded? Will you try something new or are you just like, ah, you know what? Uh, I'll try it maybe in 2017. Uh, so the, this is the Meyer Briggs framework. Uh, a lot of you guys have taken this test, but you don't know that you have. But it is a test that people take to learn what your personality type is. Uh, so uh, extroversion versus introversion, uh, sensing versus intuition, uh, thinking versus feeling. So you see the difference be between these two. So you want to say, uh, which one am I? So I want you to read through this, kind of like go through it slowly and, and kind of understand which one you are. Uh, because it's good for you to know before anybody else knows. Judging versus perceiving, right? Am I judging or am I perceiving? Is my perception correct? All right? Uh, I've taken those tests before. I've done quite well. I've taken that. I've also taken the Wonderlick uh, test. Uh, locus of control. This is, uh, you know, very, very uh, important. Uh, the degree to which an individual believes that his or her behavior is a direct impact on the consequences of that behavior. Meaning, do I have an impact on my life? Does what I do impact my future, my life, and all that. For me, I say, hey, I got a high locus of control. Definitely, I, I, I affect uh, what goes on in my life. But some people are just like, you know what, whatever I do, it doesn't matter. 
it, it is what it is, and, and that's just what it's going to be. Uh, but I just I definitely don't feel that way. Uh, Self-efficacy is very important as well as the individual's beliefs about his or her capabilities to perform a task. So do you believe that you can get the task done? Do you believe that you can get it completed? Now, some of us can be overly confident, uh, but I'd rather be overly confident about getting something done than, you know, just underwhelmingly uh, like, you know what, I know I can't get it done. Forget it. Just throw my hands up in the air. So locus of control. Uh, so, you know, for instance, some people. Uh, believe that if they work hard, they will achieve their goals. Like I fall in that category. If I work hard, I'm gonna get the things that I want in life. Uh, Self-efficacy related, but subtly, it's subtly different uh, from personality characteristic. Uh, person's belief about his or her own capabilities. Right? I believe in my capabilities to get certain things done, and uh, you guys should as well. Authoritarianism. Uh, this is the extent to which an individual believes that the power and status differences differences are appropriate within the hierarchical social system like organizations, right? Uh, do you believe that the you know the pecking order one two three from the CEO to the vice presidents uh, to the directors all the way down is is appropriate? Uh, uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Machiavellianism, uh, behaviors directed at uh, gaining power and controlling the behavior of others. So some people, hey, you know, that's our thing. He's like, I, you know, I need to control. I need to have that power. I need to control the behavior of others. Uh, I don't necessarily need to control the behavior of others. I just uh, need for people to comply with some of the, the, the plans that I have within the organization. And if they have good ideas, hey, share them with me. Let's see. I don't necessarily have to come up with a great idea. And like I always say, those, those people on the floor, they're the ones that that come up with the great ideas. I just listen to them, keep my ear to the ground, and then I implement them, and I do also give them the credit. Uh, Self-esteem, the extent to which a person believes that he or she is worthwhile and deserving individual. Do you believe that? You better, right? Uh, you should have high self-esteem. Now, some of you guys have way too much self-esteem. That's okay. I'm not going to get mad, mad at you about it, uh, but you should at least have high self-esteem. I don't want anybody having low self-esteem uh, because we should all have high self-esteem. We don't have high self-esteem or adequate self-esteem. We're not going to be able to get things done. People can smell it on us like you stepped in something on the street. Uh, you know, so if you don't have that, that self-esteem, Steam and check, right? You're, it's going to be hard for you to get get jobs, uh, get positions, move up through organizations. Uh, you know, deal with certain difficult people. Uh, you have to have that that good uh, good chunk, good amount of self esteem. Uh, risk propensity. Uh, risk propensity. Uh, this is the degree to which an individual is willing to take chances and make risky decisions. Some people will not make a risky decision at all. Uh, but, you know, like they say, no risk, no reward. Sometimes in life you have to make some risks. Uh, but some people are just like, hey, you know, I'm just going to take it easy. Right. I don't want to invest my money, you know, uh, risky in a risky situation. I'm just going to give me a CD or certificate deposit and then I'm just going to let my money just, you know, slowly, slowly grow. Other people are like, hey, let's risk it. You know, let's let's put in some, you know, some stocks that may go high and they may possibly go low. Um, emotional intelligence is something that we should all have. Uh, this is the extent to which people are self-aware, manage their emotions, motivate themselves, express empathy for others, and possess social skills, right? So somebody comes in and they're crying. It's not time for me to say, hey, Don, you know, are you done with those TPS reports, right? I, w I should probably say, you know, how's it going? Did some something wrong, something I can help you with? You know, want to go to an office, let you cry it out uh, and, and see if I can help that individual. Uh, people have to understand that there's a certain timing uh, for everything. One guy told me, yeah, and I don't know if it was a joke or if it was real, he said a lady, you know, her, her uh, I don't think it was her daughter had passed away and she called into the job and told him like, hey, you know, so-and-so passed away. She won't be in the work today. And the guy said, it's our busiest day of the week. I can't believe she did that. So he was so out of touch that he was only worried about somebody coming into work and filling that shift as opposed to somebody's, you know, a human's life, right? So sometimes people get out of touch with those things. So our emotional intelligence needs to be uh, on point, especially as managers. Um, various dimensions of self-awareness, uh, this basis uh, for the other components that refers to a person's capacity of being aware of how they are feeling. So you need to know how you are feeling and you need to know how others are feeling, right? If you don't know how you're feeling, then what you put off as a human being, as an individual, may come off to that individual wrong because you don't understand your own feelings that they may be out of whack. Managing emotion refers to a person's ca uh, capacities to balance anxiety, fear, and anger. So those emotions do not overly interfere with getting things accomplished, right? And we all have fear. We all have anger, stuff like that. But you have to manage those emotions. Sometimes you got to, you know, give it a usah, you know, put your hands together, breathe in through your nose, in through your mouth, out through your mouth, and levitate. Do whatever you got to do. Listen to well chirps, you know, um, uh, that, what do you call that, um, 
uh, meditating music, stuff like that, whatever you need to do to get your emotions in check. Uh, motivating oneself, right? So you should all be able to motivate yourself. Uh, empathy, show, show empathy towards others, especially if they you know, have a problem. And social skills, refers to a person's ability to get along with others and establish positive relationships. So not bad relationships, not the relationship we go out, we all go out on a smoke break and we just talk trash on the company. Let's establish positive relationships like, hey, how can we make the company better, which will make our lives better as well. Uh, attitudes, this is a complex uh, of beliefs. Uh, complexities of beliefs and feelings that people have about specific ideas, situations, and other people, right? So this is my attitude. Most people, you hear attitude and in, in use in a negative connotation, right? Uh, oh, she's got an attitude. He's got an attitude. But what if they've got a positive attitude? What if they've got a wonderful, sunshine attitude that, that makes everybody else have, have a better attitude? And that's the individual that you should be. You should have such a good attitude that other people want to have, and it's hard for them not to smile when they're around you. It's hard for them not to have a good attitude. Maybe when they're around other people, they can frown and say bad things, but not, not around you. Uh, cognitive dissonance. This is caused when an individual has conflicting attitudes, right? My, my parent told me this is how I should act within the company, but my manager said this is how I should act, right? It's like the people on your shoulder telling you what to do. Uh, you know, so you have a cognitive dissonance. The cognitive means, you know, it's, it's in your brain. Uh, dissonance means you have some type of, you know, disruption between the two. You don't know which way to go. Right. But you trust your gut instinct. Right. We know the difference between right and wrong. And if it feels like it's wrong, trust me, it's wrong. Um, job satisfaction or dissatisfaction is an attitude that reflects the extent to which an individual is gratified by uh, by or fulfilled in his or her work. Right. Is this is your job something that fulfills you? Do you feel like, hey, I got these reports done? Great. You know, high five. Do you feel good about it or do you just like, hey, I'm just here trying to get a check. Right. If you're there just trying to get a check, then, you know, maybe you should, you know, a look at read a book about motivating yourself and finding some position within the organization that does motivate you uh, or you could possibly you know change companies and find something that you really like to do now I know we all have to survive so uh, that's that's easier said than done uh, and I'm not saying you know if you if you don't just love your job and jump up in the morning and say I can't wait to go to work I'm not saying quit your job all I'm saying is that you should re-examine things and see if uh, that's something that's truly a fit for you uh, toss it or recycle it. I want you guys to read uh, uh, Sustainability Matters, right? I try to go green as much as possible, uh, but it, it, it's something that really, you know, it, it's, I don't want to say it like that, but it's in right now, uh, going green. There's a lot of clean uh, energy, clean air companies that are trying to do big things, uh, but it's also profitable. So, uh, you know, just think about how many solar panels you now see on people's house. Uh, organizational commitment is an attitude that reflects an individual's identification with an attachment to an organization itself, right? Uh, so it's an attitude that the individual identifies with and they attach to the organization, and we feel like it's one, it's connected. So a person with a high level of commitment is likely to see his or herself as a true member of the organization. But if you're not committed to the organization, then you don't really feel like you're a true uh, member, a true team member. If you're committed, then, then you definitely do. Uh, positive effectivity. Uh, There's a tendency to uh, be relatively upbeat and optimistic, have an overall sense of well-being and see things in a positive light and see, uh, seem to be in a good mood, right? That's basically being a, a, a optimist, right? As opposed to a, a pessimist. These are just fancy ways of saying it. Um, negative effectivity, a tendency to be generally downbeat and pessimistic, uh, see things in a negative way and seem to be in a bad mood, right? Somebody's always in a bad mood no matter what. I could hand you $3 million right now in a briefcase and you would still be in a bad mood, right? Yeah, so I tell people that, that have, you know, bad attitudes all the time and they get a laugh out of it, they get a chuckle, but they know the truth, right? No matter what I do, it they'll, they'll still be angry, they'll still be hot under the collar because that's just what, that's just the way they want to be, right? And I don't have enough time in my life to, to drag you all the way over to the other side of the, you know, of the bridge between the mountains uh, and, and, and get you over to that side. Hey, if I can't, you know, if you're not going to make that, you know, that cognitive choice to, to change, uh, then, then so be it. Right. But I can't have you, you know, bringing me down. Um, Perception. This is a set of processes by which an individual becomes aware and interprets information about the environment. Right. So like they say, perception is reality. So if people perceive that I'm unfair to my you know, subordinates, then 
I am unfair to my subordinates, whether it's, you know, true or not. And I've been in that situation where people have perceived certain things and it has been incorrect. Uh, and so I have to kind of, you know, take it, you know, go in reverse, see, you know, put in rewind, see some, you know, what, what do I do to get to this point to have them uh, believe that. Now, sometimes I've come to the to realization that, hey, I could have done these things differently. Let me fix it. Sometimes I've come to the realization that it's those individuals. They're not going to change. They got all these conspiracy theories flowing through their head. Just just let them be. Uh, selective perception, and we all do it at some point in time, the process of screening out information uh, that we are uncomfortable with uh, and contradicts our beliefs, right? So I hear, I heard that, you know, Demetrius did a great job, but I didn't hear that Demetrius did a terrible job on this, right? So I'm uncomfortable with I did a terrible job on certain things, but I'm comfortable how good I did with that. So that's the only thing that I'm going to I'm going to focus in on. Um, so, for example, suppose a manager is exceptionally fond of a particular worker. The manager has very positive attitude about the worker and thinks he's a top performer. One day, the manager notices that the worker seems to be goofing off. Selective perception may cause the manager to quickly forget what he observed. And it happens all the time. Like, you know what? You sell more than anybody else. You're the top salesperson. Uh, you know, I know you called in sick and you weren't really sick. I saw you at the movies, but I'm going to let it slide because you're the best salesperson, right? I've, uh, you know, my selective perception just sees all those sales and those dollar bills coming in. I'm going to just, you know, act like I never saw you at the movies. Uh, stereotyping. Uh, there's a process of categories and labeling people on the basis of a single attribute like your race, your gender, uh, things like that. And, and people do it all the time. Right. And, and we all do it to a certain extent, too. I'll give you my uh, my my example, because I've done it plenty of times. It, it, this one's pretty funny. Uh, so in high school, uh, you know, play for, you know, pretty high performing, uh, you know, uh, school in, uh, in a lot of sports, most specifically basketball. And we went to go play. Uh, it was Morningside. So if any guys went to Morningside, now, I'm sorry about this reference, but um, so go to Morningside and we're playing and uh, we're blowing them out. And I'm like, man, I'm like these guys like they're something must be wrong with them. Maybe they're all sick because in my mind at the time, I thought that all black people could play basketball. That was my stereotype. I mean, every, stereotypes don't all have to be bad. Right. I thought everybody could play basketball, but apparently I was wrong and they were pretty terrible. And uh, they just weren't weren't that good. But, uh, you know, up until that point, I hadn't been exposed to a team that just, you know, that had all black team and they just just weren't that good. As I got further on in my athletic career, I realized that, you know, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, it has to do with, you know, you know, hard work and dedication and, uh, you know, working at your craft. Uh, but as a kid, I was probably like 15 or 16. I, I thought, you know, they were all good. Uh, selective perception. Uh, screening out information that causes discomfort and contradicts our beliefs, right? Uh, so you see how these uh, positives and these negatives are here. But you look over here, what I truly see is I only see these positives. Stereotyping is categorizing or labeling on the basis of a single attribute. So this is how it looks, but then I, I say it's going to be just like this, right? The males do this way and the females do that way. But I've learned to, you know, not, not to generalize, not to stereotype uh, people um, and just, uh, just, hey, everybody's different. And people bring different things to the table. Uh, so perceptual process. This, uh, two of the most basic perceptual processes are selective perception and stereotyping, which we just talked about. As shown here, selective perception occurs when we screen out information represented by the symbols that causes us discomfort or that contradicts our beliefs. Stereotyping occurs when we categorize or label people on the basis of a single attribute uh, illustrated here by color. Great, great diagram. Very great uh, diagram for us to put pictures because people like pictures. People like videos. We like things that are visual, tangible that we can kind of see and relate to and say, oh, I, I understand now. Right? That's like so funny because I was looking on how to convert uh, um, I t uh, 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 iPhone voice memo to a WAV file on Windows Media so that I could attach it to, um, uh, to this class so people could hear it. And uh, and I couldn't figure it out. I looked on YouTube, found it. Some Australian lady, uh, just whatever. She just showed everybody how to do it. I watched the thing, and, and it was perfect, right? So those, those visual aspects really help. Uh, attribution is the process of observing behavior and attributing uh, causes to it. Uh, so the behavior that is observed may be our own or that of others. For example, suppose someone realizes one day that she is working fewer hours than before, that she talks less about her work, and that she calls in sick more frequently. She might conclude from this that she must have been uh, disenchanted with her job and subsequently decide to quit. Thus, she observed her own behavior, so kind of saw, looked in the mirror, saw what I was doing, attributed a cause to it, right? I'm just not happy. I hate this job. And developed what she thought was a, a consistent response, which is like, hey, I'm out of here. I'm jumping ship. The rest of you guys can kick rocks. 
uh, stress, which is not always bad. There are different types of stress. Uh, and an individual's response to a strong stimulus, which is called a stressor, right? So a stressor is traffic. And the stress is, you know, our body's effect to the stressor, right? So the traffic is, is a stressor, and then we get stressed because of the traffic. But, there, you know, there different types of stress. That's In this traffic, that's distress. Distress is bad stress. You stress, like E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -S, is good stress, right? It's the last play of the game. Quarterback gets the, the hike, right? He drops back in the pocket. He throws the ball to you. You're doing a post pattern, and, and you're putting your hands up, and you jump, and you catch the ball. That's, that's that stress where, you're, stress where your heart... It kind of stops beating and everything. You catch it, touchdown, that's you stress. Your adrenaline starts to kick in for those. That's good stress. That distress, the traffic that you sit in every day, that's that's the bad stress. Um, so you want to stay away from the bad stress and you want to uh, uh, you want to, to, to you know act 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 upon those those moments of good stress. And and I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you. So I've had some you know good you stress moments. All right. Uh, in, in my athletic career, and I've also had some some you should have been you stress moments where I either missed a shot or dropped the pass and, you know, and lost the game or whatever. But it happens, it happens to the best of them. Uh, so you look at stage one uh, and this is uh, the general adaptation syndrome, which I'll read. But stage one is the alarm. So this is your response to the stressful event. Uh, stage two is your resistance. Stage three is exhaustion. I can't keep up my defenses anymore. And this is your normal level of resistance. So the general adaptation syndrome uh, is a normal process by which we react to stressful events. At stage one, alarm, we feel panic and alarm, and our level of resistance uh, to stress drops. Stage two, resistance represents our efforts to confront. Right? I want to. Hey, I want to fight this and control the stressful circumstances. If we fail, we may eventually reach stage three, which we don't want to. We don't want to be in stage three, which is exhaustion and just give up or quit. Right? I, ca I can't do anymore. I quit. Some people say, you know what? I'm not going to quit. I'm gonna. You know, my back's against the wall. I'm gonna fight. Some people just. You know, they just back's against the wall. They just pass out. Uh, type A and type B individuals. So before I talk to you about what type A and type B individuals are, let me just tell you, don't be typecast by anybody. Uh, like when we talk about theory X and theory Y managers and type A and type B, you got to have a little type X in you and a little type Y in you and you have to have a little type A in you and a little type B in you. I'm sorry, a little theory Y and a little theory X in you. And you have to little, have a little type A and type B in you. You can't just, you know, just be one or the other. You have to have, you take those good attributes from both and use them, right? You want to be a complete individual. Uh, so type A is individuals who are extremely competitive, are very devoted to work, and have a strong sense of time urgency, right? But those may be the same people that bug you and get on your nerves. Type B individuals who are less competitive, are less devoted to work, and have a weaker sense of time urgency. And and you know what? This textbook definition is not the one I see in most, uh, but uh, really type B is somebody who's just more patient, more calm, is not may not be tapping you on the shoulder every five minutes saying, is the report done, is the report done, is the report done, right? So you have to know and under, kind of take this, you know, in, in context. Type A is somebody who's like, hey, when's it done, when's it done? Type B is like, hey, you know, just follow up with me when you get it done. They won't stress about it as much. Uh, so it, it depends on what situation and who you're dealing with, which type you need to bring out at the time. Uh, so these are organizational stressors. I want you to, to check those out uh, on your own. But, you know, obviously, uh, you know, if you're changing jobs, if you have to move to a new location, uh, some things are even stressed. Like they talk about marriage. Marriage is like a big stressor when they, they look at it on the list. It's kind of high up there, like like number 10. Uh, and it's very stressful. Uh, so you want to look look through these, the task demands, the physical demands, the role demands and the interpersonal uh, demands because it, it, it threatens your health. And if it go if it continues and goes on, then you know it could be it can be deadly. Uh, there are several causes of work stress in organizations. Four general sets of organizational stressors are task demands, physical demands, role demands, and interpersonal uh, demands. Physical demands it can be very very stressful. It's like hey, I can't I can't cut the mustard on what they want me to do. I used to work in this warehouse, and this guy he just couldn't. We were stacking these big like Fred Flintstone brontosaurus ribs and we had to stack them like 10 high and they were freezing and and, and then wrap them put them on a uh, pallet and then take them uh, or well, stack them up on a pallet shrink wrap them and then put them on a thing to be shipped out and uh, the guy he was so sure he could not pick you know he couldn't stack them like the stack was was higher than he was he even dropped 
drop a drop the you know one of the slabs of them and they broke everywhere so they they were like hey this guy you know you can't you can't physically cut the mustard uh we need you to uh, go back to the night shift and just stack the the small box small boxes burnout hopefully none of you guys have ever come to the burnout phase or you never do uh if you see that you're approaching burnout then find another position find something to do you got to figure it out it's a feeling of exhaustion that may develop when someone experiences uh too much stress for an extended period of time stress 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 no uh no fun in your life right uh you know like they say you know all, all work and no play makes you know demetrius a dull boy dull, dull boy right so you uh you know you end up burning out and then just quit and say you know now i have to go and i have to start all over but you never you don't want to be there uh, tough times, tough choices. So when stress becomes too tough to handle, I want you guys to read that. Uh, you know, stress is something that you definitely want to want to stay away from, uh, and you want to you know you want to do the right thing in terms of, of of keeping the good good stress with you and the, keeping the bad stress away from you. All right. Uh, creativity in organizations, right? You want to be creative. Uh, that's where kind of where the big bucks are. People come with those great ideas. They get the big bonuses. Uh, the ability of an individual to generate new ideas or to conceive of, of new perspectives on, exi on existing ideas, right? So you look at like uh, the phones. They come up with these new latest and greatest things, right? Be creative. Think of something new. Think of something off the wall that you think we could never, ever do. And then, and then try and implement it and try and do it, right? Go through the creative process, which is this, uh, preparation. Uh, and y'all let you read this on your own. Uh, incubation is the next step. Uh, and you always got to prepare. Proper planning prevents poor performance. That's from project management, but remember it. Uh, insight, uh, then your verification. You always have to verify to ensure what you're doing is correct and appropriate. Uh, workplace behavior is a pattern of action by the members of an organization that directly or indirectly influence organizational effectiveness, like how you're behaving in the workplace. Remember, if you're a manager, you're always a manager. You're a manager in the workplace. You're a manager if you see the person at Vons. You're a manager at all times. Uh, performance behavior, the total set of work-related behaviors that an organization expects uh, the individual to display, right? So we talk about like psychological contracts and stuff like that. We expect for you to uh, display these different types of performance behaviors. Hopefully no one has a problem here. Absenteeism, uh, when an individual does not show up for work, uh, you know, constantly, constantly. I've had people like that before. Uh, you want to stay far away from uh, from from a person that, that ends up in that bucket. Turnover is when people quit their jobs, right? You have voluntary turnover, which means that the person left, and you have involuntary turnover, which means hey, you had to fire the individual. Uh, but neither one is is good. That means you don't have the person the right person fit to the job if it's uh, involuntary, and if it's voluntary turnover, then that means that uh, you know you're not doing something to retain or keep the the good employees. Organizational citizenship is a behavior of individuals that make a positive overall contribution to the organization. Uh, remember that term. And dysfunctional behaviors, I know none of you guys have any of those, uh, those that detract from uh, rather than contribute to organizational performance. So, you know, maybe you're very negative and you, you know, uh, you're you know commiserating with everybody else and it has a negative impact on the organizational performance as opposed to having a positive impact uh, and i'm not saying you have to jump around and high five everybody but you want to you know bring the organization up no matter where it be like they say bloom where you plant it right you know yeah i want to work for google but whatever company i work for right now i'm gonna be the best me i can be at that company uh, go over your summary of learning uh outcomes and key points be sure to review those they'll be very helpful in your tests and quizzes uh, so that's it for chapter nine. I hope all of you guys have a, a wonderful day and a great week.